in pain, suffering from anxiety? How about depression? And all of your doctors want to do is put you on more pills. Pill counts, weight gain, mental fog. If you could trade all of the pills in for a natural cure, would you? Of course you would. And there is one. It's called Kratom. You need to try it. A natural plant proven to treat all of these symptoms. Please visit www.christophersorganicbotanicals.com or email Chris. He'll get right back to you. Christopher at christophersorganicbotanicals.com You are listening to the Mystic Paranormal Podcast with your host, Sean Lonker. Ghosts? Demons? Time travel? It's all right here at www.mysticparanormal.net. Want to be a guest on Mystic Paranormal? Visit our website at www.mysticparanormal.net. Click on Contact and email Sean, letting him know why you would like to be on the show. Well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, wherever you may be. I am Sean Locker, and you're listening to the Mystic Paranormal Podcast. Alright, Mark, how you doing this morning, man? It's good to have you. Hey, Sean, thank you very much. Great to be with you. I've been looking forward to that. It's been a lot of years, man, since we've spoken. Yeah, yeah, I remember when you first uh, spoke out, my heart left, because I saw that you had the same passion that I did. Yeah, yeah. That was great. One thing that, um, that we were talking about before, you know, actually doing the show here, we were talking about some of the Facebook questions were disappearing that we were going to ask on the show, and one of them was about. Well, we'll get into that. We'll get into that later. But it's just weird. You noticed that too, right? That some of the questions were were they vanished? Yeah, they did vanish, and my phone went uh, bye bye or dead. So yeah, we might be having a little spiritual resistance, yeah, brother. <laughs> Well, you know what? I think we're going to do just fine. I think uh, I think God will get us through this one. Yes, sir. So let me ask you this. Have you always had a faith in God, or did something happen in your life that brought you to God? Because a lot of people, it seems like something tragic or something significant has to happen in their life for them to actually turn to God. How, how did that work out for you? Well, uh, you're right. Um especially since I was a pastor for a uh, 15 year song. Um, I, I, you know, um, was involved with a lot of people's in our lives and so forth and, and knowing how they came to know Christ. And for me, I was raised in a, um, a godly Roman Catholic family. Now for me, I didn't really understand what a personal relationship with God was, um, just because I was not talked about. And, in uh, in our circles, so I had I had a kind of a spiritual background for sure. Went through uh, parochial school and so on. However, I went through a very serious period of rebellion. My brother, whom I idolized, uh, I was 16 years old. My brother Jack was 20 when he died at uh, oh, wow. University of North Carolina, uh, Carolina at Chapel Hill. Yeah, an accident, a fraternity accident, that crushed me. Oh, I that, can imagine. Would have, that would have been the tragedy that you're speaking to the first. Um, I undid me. Uh, psychology, I was really depressed, uh, to the point of being almost suicidal. Not almost, I was. Uh, severely depressed, yeah. And it, basically, by God's grace, he reached down and through a couple of good friends, uh, through the ministry of Young Life, um, the Lord touched my heart and brought me to Himself, gave me hope, and realized that uh, He's good. And so I would say that around 18 is when I was either saved or really brought back into a vibrant, right. vibrant walk with the Lord. Right, right. Now, another thing I wanted to ask you too was, um, it, you know, the title of our show is Our Ghost Demons. And believe me, that stirred up a lot of stuff on my Facebook, a lot of questions I was getting. I actually posted a poll up, and I said, Are Ghost Demons? Yes, no. 
Um, I have no idea, and I think it ended up being around 70% no. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, uh, it didn't surprise me because um, I thought that was fascinating. It was, it was a great uh, uh, tactic, but it was, it, was, it was a good way to get a feel for people and just to get interest generated. And it, it shows what I already knew to be the truth, and that is that the majority of uh, Americans, uh, as well as on the continent in Europe, uh, do believe in, in ghosts. And that would also lead into the church as well. There is a, um, I don't have any numbers there, but there are a large percentage of, of Christians that believe in ghosts, and you know that as well. Right. There are even a, many, many are very sincerely um, involved in, in uh, paranormal investigations. So, yeah, it didn't surprise me. Um, my comment was, you know, that God doesn't rule by democracy, though. Know? Right. Um, it, it does show the need, though, for this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really did, and and that was that was helpful. So there, there is, I think, a lot of uh, strong feeling for that, and, and, and uh, we might get into this, but there's a lot of reasons to believe in ghosts. And if I'm to be honest, not part of me wish there was. And the reason I would say that at least because I've had four siblings that have died, not to mention my mom and dad. Right, yeah, I just lost my I'm mom six mother. months ago, man. I know how you so, feel. Oh, uh, yeah. But uh, there's a lot more to it than that. And so really the last 10 years, I've, I have spent studying this issue passionately and have come to a, a strong conviction as to the answer to that question. Right. It seems like when you lose somebody significant in your life, that's what kind of draws you to want to study ghosts more, to understand them. What, mm -hmm. Let's say, you know, for instance, my mom died six months ago. Let's say I got on an EVP recorder and I actually got her voice saying, Sean, I'm okay, and it was a good voice, it was nice. What am I speaking to? Damon. In a nutshell. <laughs> saying that because you cannot, you simply cannot rely or depend upon, depend upon appearance, whether it's sound, visual, olfactory, uh, you know, what we smell, or even vibes, because a lot of people will walk into the house and say, well, I sense the spirit, but it's, mm -hmm. that is a positive spirit or a negative spirit. I don't really like the terms positive and negative because it sounds like a battery. Um, so what happens when we die, though? I know in the Bible, in the Ecclesiastes, it says the dead know nothing at all. They can't partake in anything under the sun. I've mentioned this many times. So that must be true. So when you die, are you like, are you aware of nothing until Judgment Day? Or how, how does that work out to your understanding? Uh, theologians refer to that state as the intermediate state. The Bible is really clear, Sean, that when we die, um, let's, let's assume that I die tomorrow, and as a Christian, um, well, what happens at death is that our souls are separated from our bodies. Now, originally with Adam and Eve, prior to the fall, they were a body-soul composite. I mean, that's what actually we still are. We're, that's what a human being is, is a body-soul composite. And the unnatural, death is unnatural, or wasn't supposed to happen, and it was just a result, physical death as a result of the fall. So, at, at death, our souls are ripped asunder from our bodies, mm -hmm. and that explains part of the terror of it. However, what happens is that for Christians, well, for all people, their souls will leave their body and go before God as a judge. And the soul is really the essence of who we are, our consciousness. Right, right. And so we stand immediately. Um, death is, it ushers us immediately into the presence, the holy presence of the judge of heaven and earth. And we are either sent immediately to heaven or to hell in a conscious existence as a disembodied soul. Now, with the second coming of Christ, there is going to be um, 
is going to be a public judgment uh, talked about in Matthew 25 in Revelation 20, where we will what has been made known to us personally when we die is going to be publicly announced, and we will be reunited with our physical glorified bodies, like Jesus' glorified body uh, after he was risen from the dead. So we'll have physical bodies. Okay. Um, people are mistaken when they think that when talk about spiritual body, it'll be glorified and we'll have faculties and abilities that we don't have now, but they'll still be very physical. So, uh, and then people who, who die outside of Christ will be reunited with their damned uh, bodies and be uh, in hell forever. That's amazing. So well, when you actually pass away, you're it's immediate. There is no time. It's boom. You're in front of God. You're getting judged right away. Right. Now, I have, I've written down, and, and, you know, all the reasons that, uh, that I can quickly go through as to why I believe ghosts are demons. But, you know, one of the primary ones is just how clear the Bible is about what happens when we die. And right. both on a positive and negative side, for those who are in union with Christ, Sean, that is a notion of union with Christ. That's the source of all the blessings that we have. Because union with Christ means we're united with his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And we already have one foot in heaven. And so the notion of being stuck here is, is just utterly ridiculous. And, you know, I started off my, my um, odyssey of this whole thing, hopefully trying to have an open mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I realized, is it okay if I start um, going into some of the, the reasons that I believe that uh, ghosts are demons? Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay, the, if I put it down like this, I, I want to mention Occam's Razor. That, the, Occam's Razor is a, a tool that both philosophers and, and scientists use, and it simply has goes like this, that if you have several several hypotheses that attempt to explain the same phenomenon, then Occam's Razor says that the simplest answer that explains the phenomenon is the one that should be preferred and chosen. And, chosen. and it's been shown over and over again that the simplest answer is usually the, the correct one. I think that's true in science, philosophy, and elsewhere. So I kind of use that as a guiding light, so to speak. And to me, the notion of ghosts becomes so com complicated and convoluted, especially if you have a biblical worldview, trying to fit the notion of ghosts in that becomes just ter a terrible headache. Right. You have to realize, um, when you're talking about ghosts, Sean, you're talking about at least two things which are very theological in nature, and that's the soul, because right. that's what ghosts supposedly are, right? Right, right, of course. Disembodied soul. And then you also talk about the afterlife. Now, both of those are manifestly theological issues that don't, um, don't, that aren't, aren't really um, geared towards science as far as um, accurate analysis. Now, don't get me wrong. The things that people have used, um, science can 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 help to uh, locate and see and hear, like you mentioned, the EVPs, mm -hmm. um, the presence of spirits, and the technology is getting better every day. Now, what technology can do is show that the spirit realm, the supernatural realm, or the paranormal realm is populated with spirit beings. However, that's all it can do. It cannot prove um, life after death because you can't go beyond. So that's all. That's all the evidence, scientific, scientific evidence, can show. Sean is that this spirit or unseen realm is populated by something. Right. But you cannot, and this is crucial. You cannot identify. It cannot identify what those. Um, entities are. All it can do is show that what they the sound, smell like, and so on. But it right. cannot, just by virtue of its limitations of science, as well as when we think of uh, the deception 
like Second Corinthians eleven fourteen that talks about Satan appearing as an angel of light, which by implication would mean that all the fallen angels with them, the demon, can appear as an angel of light, which simply means that the prince of darkness, if he can appear as his very opposite angel of light, then appearing as a little girl or an old lady dressed in white or a loved one assuring someone that they're, they're doing okay, all of these are door openers for the demon. Point being is it would be a snap. If right. Satan appear as an angel of light, then it'd be a snap for him to appear as a uh, deceased human being. Now, here's and an interesting I, question. I'll yeah. interrupt you real quick, but when you go into, let's say, dreams, like after a loved one passes on, you you have a lot of dreams of them. Some are good, some are bad. That's really not them contacting you at all. That's just a simple dream, perhaps maybe a, a, a demon contacting you. Because I've had some of my mom, and I remember waking up, and one of them was scary. And I woke up, and I said, Mom, if that's you trying to contact me, I said, you're doing it the wrong way. And the next several yeah. dreams were really good. So what? how do you explain that? Well, I think there's several ways that you could, because I, I've had um, many dreams of, of my deceased siblings, especially my, my brother Jack, who was the first one to die, and I think you can explain, well, the whole notion of, of dreams is a mystery anyway, Sean, so I think most of it is just, you can explain by virtue of the mystery of dreams. We dream about that which is, we think about a lot. And of course, if we lose someone, we're, we're probably going to dream about them. Now, I also say that, of course, I believe in an angels, and angels can, or the Holy Spirit, um, can um, influence our dreams as far as if, if God so chooses to give us a pleasant dream to comfort us, that's his sovereign pleasure if the Holy Spirit does, okay. but it is not. It is not our loved one that is coming back and somehow whispering in our ear and visiting us in our dreams. It's not. Once a person, the soul is in heaven or in hell, they cannot visit the earth. Right, right. They can't. They simply can't do it. And I'll go more into that um, as, as to why. Um, if I might continue, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. we got plenty of time. Okay, now... The, we need to realize that I, I know not everybody is a Christian that's going to listen to this, but if a person is a Christian, then, and this is something I, that I came across very early in my own study of this topic, was that I I realized when I was watching all these shows, Ghost Hunters, etc., mm-hmm. Ghost Adventures, and I started seeing that at least some of it was real supernatural activity, there's such a wow factor to it that it can overcome yeah. those yeah, there is. Um, primary conviction to Christ. And if somebody has jettisoned God, um, they still have a deep longing for spiritual reality. And so if they see supernatural activity that is, you know, immediate contact with supernatural, boy, that's, that's electric. Mm-hmm. So I understand why people uh, are really drawn to it. Uh, but that's, that's the danger of it because, um, this really trying to eat the forbidden fruit. God is um, God doesn't want us messing around. That's why it tells us in Deuteronomy Deuteronomy eighteen to not attempt to communicate with the dead. Yes. That's yes. Leviticus nineteen and, and, and twenty as well, which means that any attempts at EVPs are sinful. Uh, right. And right. Again, and, and, you know, EVP, Sean, as you well know, you well know, are the backbone um, of paranormal investigations. If you take EVPs as being the broad um, category for any attempts to initiate communication with, with the spirit realm, whether it's with flashlights, a tape recorder, or you name it, uh, you know, they all you know become under the general category of you know, trying to contact the, the dead, and it's called an abomination. Um, and it's just as strong in the Hebrew as it is in the English. 
there there are gradations of sin. It might come as a surprise to some people. All sin is a cosmic treason. All sin is serious, but there are some sins that are more serious in God's eyes. And the occult sins mentioned in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18 are especially heinous in God's eyes. And um, so you have uh, the ob, which is the Hebrew word for medium, don't, don't contact medium, okay. don't attempt communication with the dead, and no necromancy. And necromancy is the same thing, so it's like God is, the way they did it in the Hebrew to accent something instead of having an exclamation point was to repeat things and more than once, like Jesus said, amen, amen, and that was like the way of saying, hey, listen, this is really important. So, any EVPs, I don't understand why Christians don't get it, uh, it when the scripture is so clear. Um, I, I have this, I, I have this little syllogism, logic, logic syllogism that I use, and that is that um, all attempts to communicate with the dead are, are um, seriously sinful. Uh, EVPs are an attempt, are an attempt communicate with the dead. Therefore, uh, EVPs are, are dreadfully sinful. Um, that is, um, that's, you know, what is known as syllogism in logic. Well, I'll but, tell you what, Mark. Um, Last time me and you interviewed, I had, I had completely stopped ghost hunting. I, I wanted nothing to do with it. But it was only a few months ago that a friend came over. It was right after my mom died. And he's like, we got to go to the cemetery and do this. We get some wild stuff, some EVP. So I ended up riding along with him, okay? And we did an EVP in there. And I'm telling you, clear as day, we got a voice that was cussing us out. And I kid you not, Mark, the very next day, I went to church. And they set me up for a baptism. That's beautiful, Sean. That, it was that scary. It, it really was. Well, I'm glad. You know, because they, they demons, uh, they either do overt activity or covert activity. Covert being they'll cover themselves. You know, people have a picture that a, a house is haunted. It, it uh, There has to be crucifixes flying or things moving around, that sort of thing. And that happens often. That's known as overt demonic activity. But in my mind, the scarier kind of demonic activity um, that paranormal investigators or just people who are messing around with a Ouija board or trying to contact the dead in a cemetery or just in their own house. Right, um, right. Is, is what I call a happy haunt, in, in quotes. And that is where you have the presence of the demonic, but it's not causing um, what, what we would usually call paranormal activity. They, their, their strategies differ. Uh, right. Depending upon depending upon their assignment from their superior, and think of it, Sean. If um, if the demons are very brilliant, uh, much more so than we are, they have a lot of they have thousands of years of experience, and and if they know that overt activity that is you know causing objects to fly around, if, sometimes they know that that's going to uh, to bring out the Calvary and right. um, possibly get them kicked out. So oftentimes they'll just sit silently like spiritual radioactivity in the corner, so to speak. You know, we're talking about spirits here. But you're emitting deadly rays. Uh, and and the, the point being is that there's much more progress in, in, this, in the spread of the kingdom of darkness if you can get an entire family moving in the wrong spiritual direction where they begin to question whether Jesus is the only way to, to God and, you know, a long walk in the wrong direction to hell uh, accomplishes a whole lot more than Satan's mind. That's what he wants. And I just want people to know that you don't have to have overt paranormal activity in your home for there to be that your house to be infested. However, there are people who are listening to this um, who do have paranormal activity, and you're not doing anything about it. And right. I, I want you to know, I want people to, this may sound simplistic, Sean, but all paranormal activity is demonic activity. I'll say it again. All 
paranormal activity is demonic activity. Angels do not do mischievous things like footsteps, moving car keys, throwing right. objects, smashing people, that sort of stuff. Yeah, angels are real. Um, God, the Holy Spirit certainly isn't going to do that. And uh, as we'll talk about more, it's not a ghost. So if you have paranormal activity going on in your house, I beg of you to get somebody who's competent and godly to cleanse your house and or you. And there's the, the, uh, the deep, dark secret of the paranormal community is how many paranormal investigators are themselves suffering oh. physically right. from the consequences of what they have done and that they have brought home into their into their own houses uh, tag along, what I call tagalongs. Um, now, if you do something, if God commands us not to communicate with the dead, and we go out and do it, even with the most sincere motives, we're still disobeying a clear command of God. And what that does is it takes away the um, the barrier of protection that God puts around all people uh, with reference to the demonic. Now, now, he's able to tempt everybody, but, but there's a thing called com- what theologians call common grace, and that that's, that's kind of a protection that God puts over all people from, you know, protecting us from violent attacks. Right. You, you know something, and Mark, that kind of... When we do serious sin, like getting involved in the right. sin or communicating with the dead, and that's when God pulls away his common grace protection and we then begin the process of uh, infesting our house and then the oppression and then that could lead to the possession. So, See, out there. That, that's what gets to me is like when people go into a graveyard, they're like, don't worry, just imagine light Christ around you, the, the light of Christ, and you'll be all right. He tells you don't do this stuff in the beginning, so you're not getting any protection from God when you're actually ghost hunting. Good, good point, Sean. Why? Why God's not going to answer their prayer? Um, because you're, you know, you said it. We're disobeying God in the first place. So um, all these prayers that you see investigators doing, asking for protection on TV um, and so forth, when the main thing they're doing is an abomination. Right. It's not just a little peccadillo or a small sin. It's a horrific sin in God's eyes to uh, attempt communication with the dead. Uh, people need to realize that. we there, God, I think the main issue, Sean, is that we've lost a, a uh, proper understanding of the burning holiness of God. Right. There's judge of heaven and earth, that he's holy, and that his law, truth, is holy, and it's objective truth, and it doesn't change, um, then we would, or, or, I, I think that we would, we would not be as quick to do some of the things that we do, and also, one of the things that convinced me as well of the danger of this was that I learned in theology that any any belief that by inference diminishes the person and work of Christ, then you can you can bet that that belief is heretical or wrong. And what I mean by that is, if you think about the notion of ghosts long enough, and if you think about the person of Jesus as the second person of the Trinity, who is now the God Man in heaven has a glorified human body united with his divine nature. He came down and he died for our sins and was punished for them. And the notion of ghosts in so many ways diminishes the infinitely precious uh, blood of Jesus. It diminishes the effectiveness of the blood of Jesus in bringing his children home. Um, it diminishes the seriousness of snubbing the blood of infinitely precious blood of Jesus uh, by saying that people can get stuck here indefinitely um, or not even choose to stay here 
there because of their fear of hell. Um, I've heard that. Yeah, I mean, I've always and wondered, I, how could the death process be so flawed to where you die and you don't know where to go, and yet someone living is going to be like, go to the light. I've never believed that. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you that right now. I've never <laughs> believed that that you, that somebody can actually die, and and I don't know that the natural process just want to take care of itself. Right. Well, that gets back to what we're talking about. You know, Jesus is the light. And so when people talk about going to the light, they speak of it as a it. And Jesus said over and over, he is the, the light. And so all these attempts to cross people over is just a fool's errand because the demons are laughing at them. Um, I, I, I say this tenderly and with humility, um, Sean, because I, I don't want to come across as uh, as being judgmental or sarcastic because I know that many people who believe in ghosts and especially those who are trying to help people who are being oppressed, they're sincere. But, you know, there's an old saying that a person can be sincerely wrong. We right. can live all day long that two plus two equals to five and uh, you know, our sincerity is not going to make that true. I have. All the more I have an important realize, question I want to ask you, Mark, and that you might think it's extreme and the listener might think it's extreme. What do you think is more deadly? What what's what what's more problematic? People watching pornographic material, no, I know it's not good, or actually going out ghost hunting watching these um paranormal stage, ghost adventures. Is it the same thing? Or, or do you, do you, do you can, is there any kind of balance to the two topics? I would put them in, both of them in the category of being the, both of them being addictive and both of them being serious sins. We talked about gradations of sin. Right. And not to pick on sex. The only reason why sexual sin is seriously wrong is because it's seriously beautiful in God's eyes. It's one of the highest gifts that God has given us right. when it's abused and depraved um, I think they're saying the best things when twisted become the worst so you know that's a good actually analogy because I have seen and I know you have as well uh, the number of paranormal investigators who get addicted to mm -hmm. the process of acquiring evidence mm -hmm. And studying the evidence. I've been there. As to your question about pornography, I think I don't. I don't know how to say which is worse. I would say they're both pretty much. In, they're both abominations. Like pretty much. Orders, but they're both, both very pretty high on on the uh, list of degradation uh, of serious sin that can have harmful effects. Because pornography, pornography is one of the quickest ways to open the doors to the demonic um, because of the nature of defiling one of God's most beautiful gifts. And then, of course, when you attempt to speak the spirit world, folks don't realize that they're communicating directly with demons. Right. Now, do you that's, believe why, that's why I really believe this is, this, the notion of ghosts is one of, if not Satan's most favorite and successful um, tactics today is just a notion of ghosts because what quicker way short of flat out satanism can god get large number of people in direct communication with evil spirits than the belief in ghosts right it has opened up a floodgate i mean our country in the last 20 to 30 years because of this explosion of interest and mushrooming of interest and fascination with the ghosts mm -hmm. it has it has opened so many, uh, the word topos in Greek used in Ephesians about not giving the devil a foothold or an, uh, you know, an opportunity. Um, that's what we're doing, where the floodgates have been opened. And we, we're like what people used to think about the deepest, darkest regions of Africa before, you know, where the gospel never been, and there was just black magic all over the place, and, and you know, missionaries going 
going in and, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff going on, supernatural. That's what the United States is becoming real quick. That's what um, I wanted to ask you. Started Where when, are we heading? You know, nine years ago, there were 900 paranormal groups. Yeah. There's like, uh, yep. I think, 2,000. Sorry. No, I was just going to say as a nation, as a world, I mean, where do you think we're heading with all this paranormal activity entertainment that we have out there now? I mean, hell, man. I mean, we're opening up the gates to hell. You know, it's not that the demons aren't all already here. They're here. It's just that we um, here are tearing down the walls of, of yeah. God's protection by violating his clear commands to not communicate. So it's our country is, is is becoming demonized, and I I, um, I know that can I make this one real quick question? Uh, absolutely. One, one, okay, one man uh, had mentioned that um, why you know, we read this? Uh, why do I believe in demons if the word demon is not mentioned in the Bible? I had oh, somebody yeah. say that to me that wanted me to ask you that. I was going to ask you that that demon is not mentioned in the Bible. Is that is that true? Go. I'll let you explain. Yeah, no, um, I'm, I'm not sure where this, this kind gentleman got that notion, but it's, it's just simply not true. Um, I mean, all I had to do was look at my concordance, um, and in my, my Greek text, te- testament, the word, uh, in Greek for demon is daimonion. And, uh, in, see, the singular for demon, daimonion, is used 16 times. Okay. The, uh, word for demon possessed, which is, Daimonion zone um, is used 16 times, and then the plural of a demon, uh, demon, demon is used 49 times. So you have 16 plus this, so you have about 80 times where the, the actual word for Greek word for demon is, is used. Not to, so, wow. you know, it's just, it's just not true. And then you have the synonyms that we talked about yesterday unclean spirits, elemental spirits. Um, uh, Satan's angels or uh, fallen angels, principalities and powers. So, but specifically where demons is mentioned uh, explicitly. So I'm, not, I'm really not sure where it's down and got that information. Yeah, he, I think he probably just looked up the word demon and wasn't really thinking about translations. It's probably what it was. That's the only thing I could think yeah. of. But it's clear in the, in the Greek. I mean, excuse me, the English translations as well, so uh, I'm puzzled as to... All right, now, Mark, believe this or not, we are more than halfway through the show right now, and we have okay. not spoken about a book that you have that people could read to actually help them for what's going on right now. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up, because it raises actually an important issue, and the, uh, the name of my book, I chose the, the, the title carefully. It's entitled Seeing, see, excuse me, Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes. It's Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes. And you can, the uh, best way to find it, really the only way now is, is through Amazon. Okay. And um, you can get it, you know, as an ebook or um, you know, soft pack. But what I do in the first part of the book is talk about the importance of, of a worldview. You know, it's not just Christians who have a, uh, you know, the Bible or an outside um, authority that we look to to answer this question. Everybody has an ultimate criterion that they appeal to and that affects their way of seeing the evidence. Um, but most folks are not consciously aware of that. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that when they go into, for example, paranormal investigator, when they go in to do an investigation, their their presupposition, you know, the basic assumptions in the back of their mind about, you know, how how do I know what is right and wrong? How do I know what God is like? You know, it's basically the question of how we know what we know. Right. And so. Those, for a Christian, we know that, um, you know, the Bible is not an exhaustive handbook on demons by any means. Uh, there's things that we can learn, but it has plenty to say 
And when it does say, then they are inerrant and, and, and infallible. And so, anyway, um, I say that about my book because I laid the foundation with encouraging and teaching people how to think with the biblical worldview and what that means and how, because that's what means we're supposed to, as Christians, see all of reality through God's eyes um, and to realize that every, God owns everything. He owns our souls. Um, yeah. It's another argument for the, you know, the nature of ghosts being uh, not acceptable to a Christian. Um, but the second part of the book is, is I then ask, okay, how does the notion of ghosts, how does it um, fit within a biblical worldview? I don't just ask what does the Bible say about ghosts that, that had been done, mm-hmm. and it, it would be a short book because the Bible doesn't talk explicitly about ghosts very much. But um, using the seven components of a um, biblical worldview, I just simply ask, okay, how does the notion of ghosts, um, how does that compare with um, the biblical teaching on the nature of God, sovereignty, his holiness, you know, the fact that he is our father, um, ado- you know, spiritual adoption, is to me the notion of ghosts is it really kind of a denial of the teaching of spiritual adoption that God is our Father? Because to me, ghosts are like spiritual orphans. Right. Left here. And I, I wanted to let the well, listeners. Listen. I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I was just gonna say. I mean, think about the the, the common idea of even just little children um, being supposedly left here, which is horrendous. Just the notion of that. Yeah. Um, being in the same realm with people like Hitler, and that destroys the whole biblical um, comfort for justice. You know, God, a friend of mine said that his second favorite promise in the Bible is, um, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Um, <laughs> and so there's reason that, you know, if, if people get stuck here, then that blows away the beauty of the biblical teaching that, you know, at the afterlife, the scales will be balanced and all the pain and injustice that we have experienced and others have experienced that, 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 that people will get um, uh, what, what, what they deserve. Um, I mean, we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Right. But, you know, it's like there's no... Uh, people may be surprised to hear this, Sean, but there is not a there's not one place in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, that ever mentions that a human soul is trapped here on earth. Not one. Now you get people who say, Well what about Samuel and the, the medium of Endor? It's not which, by the way, it's, it's medium. Okay. No nope. Samuel. Is as odd as that uh, text is, he wasn't trapped. Right, so, right. Uh, in all in all other incidences where ghosts, and phantasm, or whatever uh, is mentioned in, in the Old New Testament, not once, not once, uh, are we told or warned about um, that there are people who are, are earthbound or trapped spirits. Jesus never sought out like we do um, people who are trapped. Now, are we more all knowing? And are we more compassionate than Jesus that we're doing a ministry that he did not do? He didn't have a ministry to bring to the light uh, earthbound spirits. Why? Because there weren't any earthbound spirits. Also, the earthbound spirits never approached him. Right, right. He never, he never mentioned that. And there's, there's a couple places in the Gospels where the... Uh, disciples thought Jesus was a ghost, and, and, and that will take us too far afield. But I'm talking about specifically that the Bible never, I mean, you would think that if if you take the death criteria, which is, the notion, that's what I call it, is if if a person dies a violent death, they die an emotional death, they, if they die with unfinished business and so on, those things make a um, predisposed person to, to being earthbound, right? 
right? Right. That's the common notion, right? Well, two things about that, Sean. Number one, the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Um, but let me talk, just talk about science. The vast majority of people, let's just talk about military people uh, and how horrible the implications of this death criteria are. If you take it logically, then all the guys just in our country in the last, you know, all of our wars, all of them should be very good candidates for being earthbound spirits. Now, what a way to crown and, you know, honor these guys by saying, well, you, you, you know, you're 20 years old when you died in Afghanistan. Um, it was pretty emotional death being blown up by an ID or shot in the, in the gut. Right, uh, right. <laughs> left behind uh, a little, you know, wife and a child. So you have all these people. But the point, my point I'm trying to make is the vast majority of people in the world who die uh, with these, all of the death criteria, do not come back as ghosts. Right, so right. If, you do, if you're talking about a scientific hypothesis where the, that in the vast majority of cases it doesn't hold true in the lab, you would throw the hypothesis out. But no. because in, in, the, in some instances where there's violent deaths, you know, there's a court haunting, uh, people will latch on to those. And I admit there's a growing number of hauntings or again, infestations. Right, That's right. because demon, demons hate us, and where there is human death, they are drawn to that. But my, my only point was that, that you you can't have the number of people who died with the death criteria is so great that that hypothesis is blown out of the water because the vast majority do not get stuck here. And by the way, who was causing them to get stuck? It's sure not God. But who, who is? And then, by the way, who doesn't die? Who doesn't die with unfinished business? Who doesn't die right, with right, emotional yeah. death? You know, who doesn't die um, with some some kind of trauma? So where do you draw the line as to when enough is enough? And it's not exactly. enough. And the next thing, Sean, I would say is that you know, the quickest way to destroy hope in a person's heart is to say, well, you know, People who believe in ghosts, they have to try to see what the logical extension is of their belief, and they might start thinking twice about it. Mm -hmm. um, thinking as a pastor, but just as a human being, if somebody is sensitive and they think about this long enough, like, yeah, the Bible's so full of hope. And, and hope, you know, is, is certainty that when we die, if we know Christ, we're going to heaven. But the notion of ghosts, Totally blows that out of water. Right. And Mark, I wanted to bring up real quick. I wanted to bring up to the reader, or I'm sorry, the, the listener out there. If you want to read Mark's book or, or pick it up, if you go to mysticparanormal.net and you click on guest, we got a picture of his book right there that you could click on that will actually take you directly to Amazon where you could actually pick up a copy. And I think the book, Mark, is so important that what we're going to do at Mystic Paranormal is we're going to leave that link up to your book. So anytime they go on the site and they see that, they could click on that and they can order it anytime they want. Oh, well, so thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, man. I mean, I think you're doing a great thing, especially what's going on in, in today's world. We, I mean, there's a battle going on. I mean, you got to fight the good fight sometime, right? right? <laughs> It breaks my heart to see the number of people who stay, because you can't believe in ghosts without it disrupting the other components of your faith. Right. And I guess we're all pretty inconsistent in our beliefs, but it breaks my heart the number of people who who are are being oppressed by the evil one because of their fascination with the paranormal and. Their pastors don't know what to do because I wasn't taught in seminary no, that no. that was deliverance. I've done 70, by the way, uh, the listeners. This is not just theoretical for me, gang. Guys and gals, uh, as John would say, uh, uh, I've been involved, yeah, probably about 70 cleansings of both people and homes. That's something and, I wanted to and, talk to you about. We don't have time today, but maybe another show. 
where we can come back and get some of your personal stories of things you actually witnessed and had to that go was, through. Uh, that would be, that would that'd be, be. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. I have to say this real quick. Yeah, absolutely. That is, uh, in, in the ones who thought that they had a human haunt, when we went there, every single case, um, when it the, the entity was challenged in the name of Jesus, and this goes for aliens as well. When it confronted with the point. name of Jesus, the true identity has always been uh, revealed as demonic and, and never remained as human. Always. I wanted to go to Facebook, Mark, and I wanted to read some of these questions here because it. I like to try to get the you know these people more involved. Let me just scroll sure. through some of them here. Okay, we got a, a girl by the name Shelly Call. She says, how do they get into our dimension? I, I suppose she means demons. Yeah, well, going back to our, um, that's a good question, by the way, Snowy. If they're already in our dimension because they, Earth is their home. Um, God sent them to Earth. So what people, again, don't realize is that when they speak into the spirit realm, they're jumping into Satan's sandbox. Demon, Satan and his demons are already in our dimension. Um, it is our sin, particularly occultic sin, that um, opens up the doorway. I wouldn't call it a portal. Um, there's no need for a portal because they're already here. It just are just a beatus. We all sin. So I don't want to get people to get paranoid. Okay, we right. all have sin, and 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 we just ask God to forgive us. But if somebody is involved with consistent serious sin, then that's going to open the doorway for God allowing them to to start oppressing us. And um, so again, it's not a matter of entering the dimension; they are already here. We try to think of like an invisible person that, right. that shows to take a magic uh, drink and a real human just beca becomes invisible, right? Right. They walk, you, you can see their footprints in the sand. Um, but that's the same way with demons, is that they're already here. They're just invisible. But since they're spirits, they don't leave footprints in the sand. Right. And that's my opinion, is that they're, they're, they're not jumping from dimension to dimension. They're in our dimension. Okay, and it kind of answers the next guy's question here, Robert Bender. Can you really be a person that attracts demons? Well, I mean, I suppose that what you do in life. Can you really attract demons? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, by the way that we act we can, and do attract. But you know, it's not just bad activity, Sean. What you're doing attracts demonic uh, attention. Right, and right. Anybody who's on the front lines of exposing satanic schemes is going to have a uh, a target. That's uh, kind of scary to think yeah, that they could be sitting around us right now growling, thinking, what is he doing? What are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I was writing my book, I got slammed back in my chair. Wow. Just that audibly. And, um, you know, Many of my friends, when right the night before they do a, a cleansing, um, there'll be all kinds of uh, retributive uh, attacks on them. Interesting. Very interesting. Another girl, um, Kimmy Smith Timmons, asks, if you say a demon's name, does that attract them to you? Now, that actually, I, I've heard people say you're not supposed to say a demon's name, at least in the movies. Do they actually that's, have that's, names? That, what's that? I'm sorry, do they actually have uh, names? Demons? Um, that, I mean, yes, I'm sure they do. However, a lot of the names have been gotten, gotten from the Book of Enoch, which is not in the Bible. It's not inspired. So oh, a lot of the yes. names that people think they that they have, first of all, demons lie when when they people ask their name, you never know when they really tell them the truth. But as far as saying their name, like be usable or something like that, or Baphomet or Baphomet, um, it does not I mean if a person, especially as a Christian, they don't 
we're not supposed to live in fear. And the Bible says, um, submit to God, humble yourself before him, resist the devil, and he will flee. Right. Um, we, we have the authority of Christ himself in us. And so, anyway, no, the, just saying the demon's name uh, is not going to give them any uh, power over us or invite them uh, to us. Um, now here's another question yeah. that, that somebody asked too. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's funny because we couldn't find it earlier, but it, it's back up for some reason. It says, uh, this is from uh, Christopher Milner, and he says, why do spirits seem to be attracted to running water? Why do demons, I guess, seem to be attracted to running water? And I think the same thing is said about limestone, right? Yeah, yeah. I can't find that one about limestone. That's one I can't find. Yeah. I think we kind of put those two in the same category. Right. There, um, because limestone does have, um, I forget the technical term, but, um, it, it does have the, um, uh, very fascinating, you store, you know, for a short period of time, electrical energy, and, and actually when you press limestone together, it can actually generate a little bit of electricity. Um, and I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, it, it appears that both, well, we know that water and limestone are good conduit mm -hmm. for electricity and energy, and it would seem, it would seem from um, the evidence that somehow the demonic um, can tap into that. Now, whether that increases that, their power or not, I have a little problem with that. You know, as far as them I mean, getting their batteries charged, I mean, their spirit being. So, right, of course. Um, I, I don't know. I just I think that, that, that perhaps that ha it, it is um, conducive to making their. Um, uh, facilitating their their abilities in some way, limestone and um, I mean, there's just too much anecdotal evidence to to deny that there's some kind of connection. Right, um, right. I'll tell you what, Mark. Something just came over me, man. Rather it be God speaking to me or something. I don't know, but I got this idea, and I don't discuss business online here or, or you know on the radio. But expect an email. I got something really interesting I'm going to ask you and see if you'd be interested okay. in doing. So definitely expect okay. that. But um, we're about out of time here. So the name of your book is Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes. Yes, sir. And you could get that at mysticparanormal.net. Click on Guests. You'll see a photo of the book, Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes. Click on that. Boom. Take you right to it. You can check the book out. And I did want to give a shout out to Mike. He's our music guy. Um, you can always visit his YouTube channel at youtube.com slash duality of one. That's the number one duality of one. So you want to check that out. But one thing I always like to leave the listener with or the, the guest with is, um, what, what do you want to tell anybody now that the show's ending? Anybody out there listening that might be on the fence still? Like, I don't know what way to go. I believe this guy. I believe that guy. Uh, you know. Yeah, uh, I would just say, please open your mind to the things that have been said today, because I, I know how, I, I know how cherished these beliefs are and how hard it is to give them up, especially if you're involved with other people. It makes it a lot easier to believe like you do. Mm -hmm. It makes it a lot easier to believe in ghosts. But just for the folks who are sitting on the fence, I, I would strongly urge you to think through what we have said this morning. We've gone really fast over the material. But yes, yes. It is. The whole notion of ghosts is fraught with danger. And any attempts to, because we believe in ghosts, so the logical thing is that there's going to be a I would think an attempt to communicate with them. Um, but even just the mere intellectual belief in ghosts um, will have an unconscious, unsettling effect on your faith. It's kind of like ripping 
out uh, one of the legs of the table. It was still standing, but it's kind of wobbly because it really, the notion of ghosts is not only inconsistent, but it's hostile to every doctrine in the Bible. Right. Every doctrine. The doctrine of God, uh, everything. And, um, anyway, I love everybody, and that's, that's why I would uh, care that you would please take care when it comes to this notion of ghosts. It's, um, they are, per, that they mean demons, are pure evil, and they are so cruel in a way that they, they know the buttons to push. They sure do. They just speak as a little, little child or, or whatever, and um, it may start off kind of fun. But, um, yeah, so guys and girls out there listening right now, when you're going out to your graveyards with your buddies, you're nice and young, you think you're going to live forever, and you're hearing that voice and it's real cool, you really don't know what you're speaking to. <laughs> I mean, exactly. it's nothing good. I've had personal experiences with it. Nothing good's come out of it. Mark, I want to thank you for coming on the show, bud. Expect an email, and um, and God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Mystic Paranormal Podcast. To help support the show so that we can bring you the best quality shows possible, please visit www.mysticparanormal.net. Scroll down to our GoFundMe icon and donate as little as $5. All money raised goes directly to improving the show. Thank you from all of us at Mystic Paranormal. Good night.